Let's pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation in all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. In your bulletin, you have an outline of the sermon. If you take that out, that'll help you track with uh, the points I want to make. I want to talk about the Advent season in particular, and uh, we're going to kind of resonate with two words out of the gospel uh, where we hear those words from our Lord when he says, stay awake. So grace to all of you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Maybe you uh, have seen this that... uh, The Disney Corporation has launched a new uh, way, a new method for us to uh, consume their entertainment. They've launched this app called Disney Plus, all right? And uh, it's a pretty big deal because on this app, you don't just get to watch Disney movies and Disney television shows. Because as it stands, Disney actually is buying up uh, almost all of the entertainment universe. So right now, they own Star Wars that franchise. They own the Marvel Cinematic Universe. They own National Geographic. They own ESPN. And they own a big chunk of Fox Entertainment, just to name a few of the things in the entertainment world that they own. So this app and the rolling out of it has been a really big deal. So big, in fact, first day it was available, 10 million people signed up for it. And uh, it's been growing ever since. Now, One of the big reasons that people have been signing up for it, apart from the stuff I just named and and what they are involved in, uh, has been a show that they have been advertising for a while now that's only available on the Disney Plus app. And it's a show which is the next chapter, if you will, in the Star Wars universe that is called The Mandalorian. And Star Wars fans have been geeking out about this and... Actually, it's crossed over into something uh, even bigger than just the Star Wars universe because now they have had a breakout character from the show The Mandalorian that has become somewhat of a cultural phenomenon, and that is the character Baby Yoda, which uh, is the the popular term for it, if you will. Uh, If you haven't seen Baby Yoda, it it's pretty much the cutest thing you're ever going to see in your life. I mean, seriously, I've been showing you guys pictures of our new puppy, I regularly have to tell our dog, maybe, you know what, you're cute, but you're no baby Yoda. That thing is so much cuter. Uh, We live in a weird house, all right? But uh, anyway, baby Yoda has just broken out into this whole thing, this cultural phenomenon. So, of course, when there is a breakout character from a show or a breakout movie, and you are the Disney Corporation, what do you do? Yeah, you market the heck out of it, right? You slap that face onto anything that can be sold anywhere. And if you think I'm kidding, when is the last time any of you were able to buy toothpaste or toilet paper or bacon in a grocery store without a whole bunch of Frozen 2 merchandise bearing down on you and saying, buy me, buy me, buy me? Yeah, Disney are the experts at this kind of thing. Which is why this whole situation with the Mandalorian and Baby Yoda has been actually kind of weird. Because the Mandalorian's been out for four weeks. And it was only just a couple of days ago that you could actually buy this Baby Yoda merchandise. So what happened there? What was the problem? Well, according to one of the many articles written about this, uh, USA Today said, Disney was caught flat-footed on this one. And they did not anticipate Baby Yoda being so popular, and they didn't have anything ready to sell. They were caught off guard by what had happened. And I was reading that article, and I thought, oh, man, that is the perfect illustration for the world that we live in. Because if there's a group of people that are put together, at least it seems like it from the outside, it's the Disney Corporation, right? And They don't have any problem with telling us how put together they are and how much they are in control and telling us how we ought to do some things, right? And yet even these seemingly all-powerful worldly groups of people make mistakes. That's what is so awesome about Advent and the season that we're entering into. Because it calls you and me to celebrate the fact that we are connected to a God who is truly all-knowing, who is truly all-powerful, so much so that he controls time and space and history. And there's nothing that he is unprepared for. There's nothing that catches him off guard. And he proved it to us by sending his prophets thousands of years ago to tell the message 
of our God and the fact he was going to send his son to pay for our sins. And then what did he do? He sent his son to do that very thing, pay for our sins and then walk out of his own grave so that we wouldn't have to die forever. There's nothing that he cannot overcome. And because we are connected to this totally powerful and prepared God, Advent is the season that tells us that no matter what is happening in our lives, we have a God who keeps all of his promises and he can do that very thing. And so let's start with all this and start at the start and hear from our God why this time of year is so off, why it's so awesome. And we have to start with the diagnosis, all right? Um, unless you're a hypochondriac uh, like, like I am, you usually don't go to the doctor, do you, to find out that everything's okay. You usually go when something is wrong. Hey, I don't feel so well. Tell me what's wrong, Doc. Well, that's what our God is. He's, he's the great physician who heals us and also tells us what our diagnosis is. And he says every single human suffers from an effect called sin. And so we start there, the fact that we do have a problem. And uh, this is where a lot of the world wants to kind of tune out now. That's a big word, isn't it? Sin. A lot of the world says, no, 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 you must be mistaken. You can't be talking about me. Sin is for really bad people. That's what the other guy does, not me. And God goes, no, let, let's get the whole story straight here so that you can receive the cure for this problem that you suffer from, which is exactly what we celebrate at Advent. The fact that God loves us enough to wake us up and say, hey, here's your diagnosis. Better yet, he says, here's your cure. I sent him to take care of everything you need. His name is Jesus Christ, and he's my son. So that's what I want to talk about today, the freedom that we have because of the love of our God and how that is reflected in the season of Advent. So let's go to the outline there in your first blanks. Advent can seem like it has a tone of judgment to it, but it's not meant to cause despair as much as it's meant to wake us up. See, God doesn't warn us for something to do. He does it for our benefit. He is simply being honest with us. You know, think about all the bad weather that's going on around the United States right now, okay? We have apps and we have separate, you know, designated channels on TV for this kind of thing. And when, you know, living in the Midwest, when something really terrible is going to happen with the weather, how cool would we think the weather people are being if they didn't tell us anything has happened until after it had happened? We need them to do what? Tell us there's going to be a problem up front so that we can be prepared for it. You don't want to be stuck in the Denver airport with 1,100 other people because nobody knew what was going to happen. And sometimes that happens, but not with our God. That's what he is telling us in the wake-up call of Advent. He's like saying, hey, here's the deal. We have a problem. We are separated. We are enemies. But I have taken care of the relationship. So listen up so that you can be saved. So your next blank is the call to repentance isn't a punishment. It's God calling us to receive his grace, love, and mercy, and he wants us to have true peace, true joy, and true life for all eternity. You know, I love the readings that we use at this time of year, and in particular, I love the gospel accounts because they have so many references to people and events and places in history. And that kind of thing helps us to remember that we are hearing from the God who is... uh, true and right and this isn't some kind of fairy tale or myth this is god saying to you and me hey these are real things that actually happen this isn't a metaphor or an allegorical story or anything of that nature and one of the cool things i like about the the how specific the gospels are is is not only that they name rulers and people and places and and whatnot but i love the way that in the christmas story god uses people that society would consider nothing, or even less than nothing, to accomplish his great works of salvation. And we love that kind of thing when we see that in the movies, don't we? We love the story of Rocky, underdog who goes from nothing, plucked out of obscurity, and now is on the stage in front of the rest of the world. It's why we love Cinderella, right? Goes from nothing into a princess. We love Captain America. It goes from scrawny, weak little dude. Now he is one of the baddest superheroes in the universe. And we look at that kind of stuff. We go, yeah, underdogs. I wish I could do something like that. I wish something would take me out of my 
place of obscurity and I could be used for great things. And Advent tells us that that's exactly what God wants to do with you. First of all, he loves you enough to send his son to you to pay for your sins so that we aren't enemies with God anymore. But then he says after that, hey, you know what I want you to do with this salvation? I don't just want you to take it and go home and nap on it. I want you to use this to change this world. That's how highly I think of you. I have plucked you out of obscurity to use you for great things. So you have a very real and a very important purpose in the plan of this all-powerful God. And so these are your next blanks. Not only do you have a purpose that Advent tells you about, but Advent is a season that lets us know that history has a purpose. And again, this whole idea of purpose and God directing things, that's that's a different concept than the world we live in. Because the world we live in says things happen in a random or meaningless kind of way. That there is no purpose to all of this. Many people say there is no purpose or meaning to life, that blank. But Advent says the opposite. And in Advent, we see how God was working throughout history to put his plan of salvation into place. Think about this. Our God is in control of history and is using it to save anyone who will receive his gift. And So that's what we need to remember. History has a direction, and it's all going according to God's design and his purpose. And as we watch the Advent story unfold into the Christmas story, into the ministry story, into the death story, and the resurrection story, and the ascension story, and the story of the church, we see this God who is powerful enough to control time and eternity forever and advent reminds us he's already done this and it reminds us that he is continually doing this and will do it again when he sends his son back to make everything right and new you know in sunday morning bible class we've been talking about this very thing with the biblical reality and uh what we see in that you know that truth or myth uh bible class that's going on and we learn in there why the Bible can be trusted, because it is absolutely packed with, like I said earlier, places and events and names. And for the longest time, depending on what time uh, people were living in, there were groups of people that refused to believe uh, the events of the Bible uh, and believe in the Bible, therefore, because they said, well, these things uh, are supposed to have taken place according to Scripture, but we don't have any proof of them. And so because of that, they, uh, they just wrote off the story as a whole. Well, as technology has advanced and as we have uh, learned how to dig deeper into the earth and find things, we have found a whole lot of information that proves the reliability of Scripture. And so, for example, a couple of things that we've been talking about, you know, at one point in time, about 150 years ago, uh, the experts told Christians, hey, you guys are idiots because you believe in this book that mentions this group of people called the Hittites. And we don't have any proof of this group of people ever existing. And then what happened? Technology advanced. They were able to dig a little deeper. Not only did they find out at the turn of the 20th century there is this group of people called the Hittites, they found out later on, about four decades later, they were a world superpower. For a long time, as recently as 30 years ago, the experts said there was no such person as King David. He was just a composite you know, blob of a bunch of kings that uh, we wanted to put together to make ourselves look good. But then they were digging over, not even in Israel, but in another country, an enemy country, and what did they start finding? Proof of the house of King David, that he existed, and not only that, was in fact a king. They said over and over again, were the experts, let us tell you, dumb rubes, what is true and what is not. You can't trust the Bible because it obviously is going to have errors in the copying as it is handed down throughout the ages. And then what happened in 1947? They found the Dead Sea Scrolls and they said, oh, hey, this all matches up. And all of it, we could go on and on with this, but all of history shouts out to us and it says, don't bet against God. You're never going to win. He is always going to be right. And he wants us to know this, not because he wants to rub our noses in it, but because he wants us to know that he can be trusted when he makes us a promise. And that's what this is all about. So we need to live in these promises and the certainty of our God who has given us all of this stuff. And what he wants us to know, first and foremost, is that he sent his son 
out of his love to pay for our sins, to die for us, to rise again, and to rule with him now so that we can all be together forever and ever. And this isn't some kind of Christmas wish that, well, we really hope this happens. This isn't the Thanksgiving turkey, you know, wishbone at the table and and seeing who gets to make a wish. It's nothing like that. This is the truest truth. It's the most factual fact in the world. And he says, trust me on this. I've never made a mistake and I never will. Spend eternity with me. So next blanks. The Gospels don't record history for the sake of it. They are pointing out how God has acted throughout all time to save a world full of sinners by sending his son to pay for the sins of the world. Advent is designed to remind us that God has a plan for us. He's all about plans. He put a plan in place when we broke his law in the Garden of Eden. He said, I'm going to save you guys. He put a plan in place by sending his prophets. He put a plan in place by sending his son. He put a plan in place by giving us the church. He put a plan in place and executed all of these by letting the church do its work throughout the course of history. And he says, I have a plan in place for the end of time. And it's going to be awesome. And I want you to be there with me. And how that happens is the wake-up call of Advent where we take the stuff and get the unimportant stuff out of the way and we focus on the thing that saves us. And that's what we celebrate, that we can't do this for ourselves, but Christ did it for us. And so your next blank, Advent tells us how salvation works. You are saved by faith, not the size of your bank account, not your job, not your societal status. Focus in on what God says will save you. And that's what we're called to do. And that's my prayer for each and every one of us and the world outside of these walls, that they would hear this message and that we would be able to be used as instruments of this message for our God who is in the business of saving. You know, it was April 15th of this uh, year. Uh, Maybe you remember the cathedral at Notre Dame when it suffered that massive damage from the fire. And in the weeks following it, I thought it was very heartwarming to see uh, the outpouring of the well-to-do of France and Europe as uh, they pledged uh, all of that money to to rebuild the structure. $955 million is what they pledged to to contribute to the rebuilding of Notre Dame. And just in case you want to put that in perspective, that is uh, one million less than you guys pledged last year for the capital campaign. Um, so way to go. They're not quite at your level, but they're not bad. But think about that. Almost a, b- a billion dollars pledged by pe- Did you see that little plug right there? Yeah, yeah. Anyway, these guys pledged this uh, at the, at, you know, in the aftermath of all of that. And uh, a lot of them got a, uh, some good run pu- publicity-wise. And they were, had some articles written about them. Uh, I'm not going to name names about how complimentary they were and how gracious they were and, and very flattering, but the money for that pledge and all the stuff going on has, hasn't really arrived yet. Some of it probably will, but uh, um, they're ha- kind of having problems with it right now. Do you know how much of that $955 million that has been pledged has actually come in? 9%. And most of that has been in small amounts and most of the money that has actually arrived uh, to Notre Dame and its renovation has been from the United States for some reason. I'm not sure what that's all about. But at any rate, so there are some people that not only haven't bucked up on their pledges, but they also have had some people who once they saw that $955 million total, they just said, hey, you guys got this. We're going to back out of our pledge. And I love looking at stories like that because... When you look at that in light of the story of salvation, it helps you to realize something. How different our God is from the world that we live in. He doesn't do things just for appearance, does he? He doesn't say, here, I'm going to make you a promise, and then I'm only going to give you 9% of that promise. He doesn't make a pledge to you or a promise and then say, you know what, you guys got this. I'm just going to take this one back. What does he do? 
he completes everything he tells us he is going to do and he fulfills every promise he says he is going to fulfill and advent tells us that very thing it tells us that he is a god who can be trusted and he is a god who loves you and so it's his love that sent his son it's his love that sent the prophets it's his love that validates his promises and it's his love that places you with him throughout everything you experience in this life and it's his love that will send his son again that's what our god is all about and that's what he wants us to know at this time and every time of the year so your last blank god bless us to celebrate his gifts of repentance and especially forgiveness not just during this season but every day of our lives god bless it to be so amen